Well, good morning. And uh, thank you, Professor Brigante. And thank you, Guide Association, for the invitation to be at the workshop. And thank you to uh, Jenny Petrucci, who met me in Athens uh, uh, six months ago and asked me to uh, attend this event and has been so kind in making arrangements for me and I am sure for many uh, other participants. I like this kind of small event. Uh, Twenty years or so ago when I started the American Center for Study of Distance Education, I wanted to put on uh, some opportunities for people to think about research in distance education, which at that time was not very uh, extensive. And I thought workshop and conference, conference is too big, and I came up with the word, I thought symposium sounded like a nice title. And I looked up the dictionary and it said a symposium is a meeting with good food, good, food. good company, oh. and good conversation. Good and so I thought, yeah, this is what we want. So uh, we had about 50 people and we had good conversation. And that is really what I'm looking forward to here with people from, not too many people, not one of these big, big conferences, but people from many, many countries. And we'll be able to talk together and make friendships. And that's what a good symposium or workshop should be about. I have uh, what for me is a challenging uh, mission that Jenny gave me. Uh, because we're in a day of fast-changing technology. Just yesterday or the day before, I heard someone say that Facebook has, I think it's 200 million <coughs> participants, and it's going up by 1 million every, every month or something. Is that right? Was it monthly? And a new blog is beginning every second. <laughs> and she asked me if I would talk about the past, about where we came from. And so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, with a little, a little misgiving, I'm very much involved in the present, and you are all in the present, and perhaps I'm one of the few who, uh, along with at least one other person here, has been involved in this field for a very long time in the past. I started in 1963-64 in Africa. I was interested to hear about Africa earlier. When we began working with radio, we tried television, but that didn't work in Africa. We began working with radio to extend the opportunity for learning beyond uh, the university through the technology of that day. And that's what we've been doing from then until now, is looking for ways of extending the facilities of the university uh, beyond the walls of the, of the campus. Many of you, like me, when you first came to Rome, looked at the history, uh, the eternal city. It's wonderful to be here. And we look, before we go somewhere new, to what we ought to know about the past. And I think the same applies to we who are in the cutting edge, the latest, most progressive form of education the most progressive form of distance education. We need to know who first thought of it. How was it expressed? What were the circumstances that gave rise to the idea of the practices that we do 
today. What were the effects of the idea in the past? Were they all good effects or were there problems? What were the reactions of other people at the time? Were there controversies? Who, who took sides in the controversies and why? Most of you know, as I do, for sure there were controversies. Our field has had resistance from the beginning, and we still have resistance. So it's not a bad thing. I hope you'll allow me to take us back and look at some of the events that occurred before, because surely, as has been said, if we don't know history, we're likely to repeat the mistakes of the past. So. What, let me say one other good reason for looking, uh, looking at, the, at, at the foundations, the foundations of our practice. I, like some of you, have been supervising doctoral research for many years, more than 20 years. I see proposals for research almost every day. And as editor of this journal, I read hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts. I have rejected many proposals, and I have rejected hundreds of manuscripts because the student making the proposal and the author making the manuscript does not know what are the roots of the question that he is asking in the research or that he is reporting in the manuscript. To send a manuscript to an author that says, I took data from a population, I analyzed the data, and here is the report, is of very little use, and it is usually rejected. Why? Because it does not explain the foundation or the root of the question. Why did you gather data from that population and do the analysis of that data and report the results? What does it connect to? What previous knowledge does it connect to? If you don't know, what is known, you cannot make an intelligent, researchable question. And you may spend three years gathering data, but if it does not connect to previous knowledge, in other words, grounded in a theoretical framework, it is misguided and very sad that we who supervise research, not so bad with research because we can advise the student, but it's very sad with manuscripts to see material that's good data, well analyzed, and well reported, but badly grounded, badly grounded in what was known before. So that's the second uh, justification for spending some time with you this morning, another 40 minutes they promised me, simply taking us back and saying, where have we come from to be where we are today? And after this 40 minutes, uh, I then hand it to you to go out to discuss the blogs and the Facebooks and the, and, and the Second Lives and, and all the other Web2 technologies that, indeed, I am also very much involved in. In fact, I want to show you here uh, what I call to begin with the future. Uh, this is a, a, a screenshot of the Museum of Distance Education and Technology that one or two of my students and I are currently establishing in Second Life. Now, I'm going to go fairly quickly. Don't try and make any note. Just get an impression. If you're interested, we do have a paper, and I'm going to go fairly quickly. But there were studies on, um, on uh, the use of uh, distance education through uh, print technologies beginning not too long after the, um, after the First World War. 
the first international conference, I'll come to that, I guess, in fact, was held in 1938, international conference. Okay. Uh, the, the one name that anyone who needs to know uh, the roots of our field, the scholarship of our field, uh, is Charles Wedemeyer. Professor Takamoto is one of the few people here who remember Professor Wedemeyer. Um, Wedemeyer did the following. Wedemeyer had been in the U.S. Navy in World War II. He had had the responsibility for uh, trying to transmit training to people in ships around the, the world, uh, and uh, that had got him uh, interested in uh, the idea of what we now call teaching at a distance. When he came back, he had a vision. He said, what would happen if we applied the principles of industrialization that applies everywhere else uh, in modern society to education? Because after all, most education has not been through the Industrial Revolution. Most education consists of a small number of people in a room with a person talking to them with very minimal use of technology. What would happen if, just as in making a motor car, you have one specialist who does one part of the project? This is Adam Smith. Those of you who know economics, uh, Adam Smith talked about shoes. If instead of having one person making a pair of shoes, you have one person to cut the leather, one person to make the sole, one person to do something else and something else and something else, and then put it together, uh, would, what would the effect of that be in education? In, in the automobile industry, it reduced the cost of the automobile so that millions of people could have an automobile where previously they could not. What would happen if you did that in education? In 1963-65, with a small grant, Wedemeyer tried this by having some specialist doing some part of the curriculum development, some specialists uh, contributing the um, uh, certain parts of the content, others other parts of the content, others providing library support, others providing uh, uh, student support, and co communicating this out of the campus to that which was best done by radio, that which was best done by television, that which was best done by telephone, which was quite innovative in the 1960s, um, pre-computer. So using different technologies and different specialists, uh, having deconstructed the teaching process and then reassembling it in a systematic way. And that essentially is what we do in distance education to this day. The original vision of this, the concept of this, was this man whose, um, whose uh, picture I'm showing you here. In 1969, Wedemeyer was invited by the British to Great Britain, where he lived in the home of Walter Perry, who one or two of you will know the name of the first vice chancellor of the British Open University, was Walter Perry. There was no open university, but Wedemeyer lived with Walter Perry in his home and Walter Perry had been a medical doctor. He knew nothing about education. But Wedemeyer explained to Perry, and Perry worked with him, to think how to take this idea of deconstructing education and repackaging it and using communication technologies to disseminate it, how to do that on a big scale. It's one of the few occasions when someone in America had an idea and people in Europe developed it. More often than not, the Europeans have the, have the, the, the ideas and the Americans have developed it. That was the beginning of the Open University. The British Open University started in 1969, 1970, um, and the day before it began there were no students. The day after it began there were 25,000 students, and now, of course, 
that idea has spread around the world. There's people here from the Open University of Portugal. There's two people from India. There's people here from, where else did I see? Some other Open University, Nigeria is here. But 20 or 30 institutions around the world now, <clears throat> 30 or more institutions around the world now, that have national open universities providing high quality to large numbers at lower costs. It's like, like the Ford Motor that I, I referred to. When it's done on scale with efficient organization of resources, not only do more people have access, uh, uh, and not only is the quality of a high standard, but the average cost is much lower than it is in conventional education. So this was the, uh, this is the visionary who uh, gave us the idea of the Open University. There's a picture of Walter Perry. Uh, this, this is Perry, the first uh, vice chancellor of the British Open University. That is Wedemeyer next to him. Um, and this young man over here uh, is me in my better days. Uh, I should say also, Wedemeyer, uh, as part of that experimental um, process that I referred to, um, um, saw the importance of scholarship, of research. Uh, the early days of correspondence had been very practical, uh, uh, generating income. Um, there were private schools. Some of them were very poor. Some of them were good. Uh, Wedemeyer began the first uh, uh, research and the first research uh, publications. In Europe, uh, at about the same time, but not long after, a little after, these are the two giants of European distance education scholarship. If you don't know, please read. <laughs> Holmberg uh, was... Uh, and still is, a citizen of Sweden, uh, went to work in Germany at the Fern Universität, Fern Distance University, the first German te uh, distance teaching university. Otto Peters was the first vice chancellor of, uh, of the Fern Universität. Holmberg published the first book uh, on the methods of teaching by correspondence, but don't be misled don't be distracted too much by the use of the, word, of the technology. The technology is not the point. What they did in correspondence was try to decide what is it we're trying to teach, how do we organize it into units and modules of time, how do we have learning objectives, what's the best teaching strategy, how do we evaluate, what assignments do we have. Some of you here have heard me say the assignment is the core of a good distance teaching program. How do we, what, what's the assignment? What's the product that the student must make in order to demonstrate that the student has learned? The assignment, it came out of correspondence. I know correspondence is a little, you know, it's not blogging and it's not second life and it's not glamorous, but on the methods of teaching by correspondence is a pedagogical, uh, didactic uh, text. Peters did a survey of, um, uh, of distance teaching programs around the world in about 30 different countries uh, at that time and came up with a theory that was referred to as uh, the industrial model, industrialization, showing how what we do in distance education is more like what happens in all other modern life as compared to the little red schoolhouse of American mythology that I referred to. So he was having similar ideas to Wedemeyer. Peters did not speak English at that time. Uh, and, and, and some of this work was going on in Eastern Germany when there was very little communication. So these ideas were generating and developing in, in the two parts of the world at more or less the same time. Um, they were brought together uh, a, little, a little later. Um, in the 70s and 80s then, as a result, largely I would say of the success of the Open University, um, there, 
uh, res research came, became an institutional matter. Research became an institutional matter. Um, and there are some of the leading institutions, if, again, if you don't have this background, um, uh, the, uh, the research center at the Fern Universitat has a significant um, library of publications that they've produced over the years uh, in Canada. In North America, the principal research institution, I would say, is Athabasca University of the UK, the Institute of Educational Technology. I put up two or three of the names of the early researchers, important research um, in the 1970s. In the United States, we, we established the American Center for Study of Distance Education in 1986, and then we had that symposium I referred to earlier in 88, and we had the first, the first um, uh, book of uh, research and scholarship uh, came out of that, um, came out of that uh, 1986 uh, symposium and was published in 1988. And then into the 90s, the research movement um, has spread around, around the world. And I've not listed them all by any means. How could I? But you'll recognize, I hope, many of those institutions. And these are the places to look to uh, if you are proposing to do research or doing research. Uh, uh, look to the resources of these quality, uh, quality research centers. Uh, <clears throat> theory, like, like um, the research to, like, like the empirical research to which it is intimately related in the way I said right at the beginning, you can't have empirical research, can't be counting if you don't have a theoretical structure. That also began to emerge in the 60s and 70s. And again, the names, um, I think I've said enough, really, Wedemeyer and Peters and uh, Holmberg would be the three uh, principal um, early theorists. I published in 1972 material, the, I published in 1972 material that uh, in one or two iterations later became referred to as transactional distance, which one day if we have a seminar, I'd love to spend an hour and talk with you about you know, the, 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 the meaning of this and the significance of this. But I suppose at the very most simple level, we showed that, uh, that, that, that distance education programs can be uh, classified by the nature and the extent of the dialogue between learners and instructors, and today we have another dimension, of course, which is learners and learners, as well as by the extent of the structure or control or flexibility uh, built within the teaching learning program. Uh, that two dimensions, and on a third dimension, the nature of the learners, the characteristics of the learners, particularly the extent to which the learners are able or not able to make uh, pedagogical decisions, instructional decisions for themselves. Some are able to make decisions, some are not. One is no better than the other, but it's an important variable to take into account uh, when, uh, when planning programs. Um, so, so this was a significant uh, theoretical development uh, uh, in the early 1970s. <clears throat> For the first time down in Barcelona, you were there, in Barcelona in 2007, uh, Holmberg and Peters and myself were together. We're very old friends, of course, but for the first time we actually were on the platform at the same time and probably the last time. Uh, I'm not getting any younger and they're even older. So uh, it was nice for us to uh, get together and uh, uh, <clears throat> on the same program. Keegan is an important name to mention. I'm going to do an event with him uh, next week when I leave here on Sunday going up to Ireland. Keegan started a journal called Distance Education in Australia in uh, 19, well I said 80, so I guess it was 80, um, and uh, put together what he called four uh, generally accepted 
uh, definitions of distance education. And that became, uh, as I cited in our textbook there at the bottom, the most widely cited definition of distance education. Now it seems we, we lose sight of the, of the impact of these events once it becomes part of everyday life. But at that time, um, summarizing and publicizing what distance education really, what are the characteristics of distance education uh, was, was an important contribution. And this became the most published book. Well, he made a book from this article and it became the most widely distributed book and had a significant impact on, on theory. Any student uh, who begins to do research and doesn't know this underlying there uh, is working on shaky ground, I suggest. Then a range of publications. At the beginning, only newsletters. Uh, I've mentioned ICDE. I said the first conference was in 1938. That was the conference of the International Council of Correspondence Education, which in 1986, 85, somewhere around that time, changed its name to International Council for Distance Education. Several of us here are associated with ICDE. When you're talking about your, your gate uh, project, and the lady spoke earlier, you need to connect and find out uh, with ICDE, which is worldwide. Its conferences hold 150 or so nations, nowadays held every two years. Um, and uh, and the, the publications of ICCE, ICDE, are, <clears throat> are important. I've mentioned here the conference proceedings. Very important source of background information uh, as you think of going forward to doing research. And the first journals, Europe has the privilege of having produced the first, uh, the first journal in distance education uh, now gone, I believe. Uh, Epistolo didactica. Epistolo didactica. Right. Didactica. Epistolo didactica. I can spell it. <laughs> 1970s, with the establishment of the Open University, uh, their journal called Teaching at a Distance. If you find it in the library, excellent material. Uh, uh, later changed its name to Open Learning, which is now one of the four major uh, journals in distance education. Uh, one of the four is Open Learning. I think I mentioned the others here. Yeah, in the 1980s, uh, Open Learning from UK. Uh, we started the American Journal in uh, 86. Uh, distance Education in Australia, I mentioned, that had been started by <coughs> Keegan and, uh, and Mitchell in um, uh, 80, 84, somewhere around, around that time, and, um, and the Journal of Distance Education from, from Canada. The, these are still the quality research journals. People who do research based only on what they find uh, online and free are in a vulnerable situation. These journals now, of course, have electronic access, um, but um, uh, these are the, uh, the relatively high quality research journals. Um, that's the uh, Canadian journal. There's, th this, this I recommend, I, I do not recommend many of the online journals, but certainly the best of the online journals is this one that comes out of Athabasca in Canada, the International Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning. Mention one or two notable books, uh, Learning at the Back Door. The title says it all. It's so disappointing today when uh, people, I meet people who are driven in distance education because they think technology is cool. <laughs> And the point of distance education isn't to use cool technology, although it's great to use to cool technology. But Wedemeyer had this picture, the one on the right, on his wall in his office. And it shows 
um, a Russian child, a serf, standing at the door, looking in at the children inside, the people with privilege who are inside having an education, and the child, the child at the door was excluded, was excluded. And <clears throat> from the beginning of the history of distance education, the, 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 the motive, the vision has been to open the doors, to open the opportunity to people who were not able to get their education through the front door. If you're in Africa, for heaven's sake, I mean, I, I spent seven years in East Africa. I got into this. I got into this because in Africa, the people were not able to get access to where the sources of knowledge were. But I discovered radio. And if you can take the specialists in veterinary, how to, how to dip cattle or, um, or nutrition, uh, let alone literacy and, 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 and other human learning needs, and if you can get the expert into the studio and broadcast out, you can open up the learning opportunities to, to, to a wider population. So, you know, the, many times now, I fear that with, a, with our new generation of young people who are excited about, about Facebook and, and Second Life and how we can use that for distance learning, yes, 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 do it. But also remember, one of the principal driving forces of what we do is to open opportunity. My colleague, uh, Wilson Ramos, there worked, I worked with her in Brazil. We provided in-service professional development for 32,000 school teachers in the western, northwestern, and northeastern parts of Brazil. Each of those school teachers became a more effective person in her school and in her community because we were able to get learning out from the rich cities of the southeast of Brazil out to where the people ha had the need. There was no other way of extending the learning opportunities. So th this, this is an important philosophical concept, and this was an important uh, book that, um, that described that. Keegan, you see the name again, and Holmberg, and David Seward uh, from the British Open University, one of the people uh, early uh, recruited at the OU. This was one of the very first books, probably, probably the first book in Europe, certainly, that brought together the ideas of the European and some of the American leaders of the time. First book about the Open University is by Greville Rumble and Keith Harry, who were both uh, uh, employees at the UK Open University. Uh, I should mention Theory and Practice of Distance Education, one of the later books by Holmberg. Uh, Peters on Distance Education, The Industrialization. I mentioned he had the idea earlier, but it was all in German, but this was then published and dis distributed in, um, in uh, in English, the main textbook that we use in introducing students to distance education in the United States, which has now been published in the um, three Asian languages and also in Portuguese in Brazil. And the handbook, several people, uh, several of you know this. This is a compendium of 55 chapters uh, of leading researchers that summarize the research in, uh, in specific, um, specific sub-fields uh, of, the, of the broad field. Uh, there are several uh, important uh, book series, one of which I mentioned here, uh, that Fred Lockwood has done a great job with the Routledge Company in developing probably 20 different books on um, on distance education, open and distance learning today. And then the conferences, a source of uh, scholarship and research beginning, uh, well, the first American in uh, the end of the 19th century. But then I mentioned ICCE, uh, ICDE, 
19, that shouldn't say 48, that should say 1938. The first one was held in 1938 in Victoria and British Columbia in Canada. Um, the OU, uh, European Council, uh, European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. Uh, we started our conferences in the late 80s. And then the ICDE, uh, again I've mentioned. There are proceedings of all of these conferences. Only one conference doesn't have a book of proceedings. That was held in Australia in, uh, I forgot the year, but it was when microfiche became, uh, <clears throat> became popular and they put the proceedings on microfiche and as a result nobody has been able to read it ever since. And so an example where the old technology <laughs> does a better job. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there are databases, uh, Peter's uh, organized not online of course in those days, a database based on his research in the 30 countries I referred to. Uh, the OU for many years ran an important documentation center at, uh, at the OU in, uh, in Milton Keynes. When I worked at the World Bank in the mid-90s, we established what we call the Global Distance Education Network, and that, that our vision was, and it, oper and, it, and it was successful, was to set up um, uh, regional centers around the world, one in South Africa, I remember, one in Indonesia, one, I don't remember where the five or six were, uh, the Commonwealth of Learning, and Cole was mentioned earlier, you, you ought to know the Commonwealth of Learning. If you don't, they do wonderful work, produce wonderful training materials, as well as literature, and they took over the Global Distance Education Network, and uh, that is still functioning. Uh, there's a screenshot of that event. I am watching my time. I've got eight minutes, um, according to my time here. Professional development and academic studies. Um, well, the names are the same, really. Holmberg, Holmberg created uh, training courses for the European Association of Distance Learning. Um, Wedemeyer organized uh, uh, faculty lectures. Earlier I didn't mention it, but there was a publication called the Brandenburg Memorial Lectures. Uh, that was a publication in which he brought together uh, uh, research-based um, talks uh, given uh, during that project that I referred to. Um, I took over Wedemeyer's uh, first, the first graduate course, the first postgraduate course was taught at University of Wisconsin-Madison in the early 70s, and when he retired, I took that over. The UK Open University has been powerful in providing professional development, but more focused on the professional development of its, uh, of its own uh, staff as compared with perhaps the more scholarly or academic kind of um, professional development that we have uh, developed subsequently. That's not a criticism, uh, it's a statement of fact. Uh, one of the very first um, online uh, participative, interactive, I suppose nowadays we would say social networking kind of events held in 1993, Terry Anderson, who's gone on to publish a lot of very valuable research uh, material subsequently. At that time, I noticed he was a PhD candidate uh, done under the auspices of the ICDE. Um, and so we come to some of the present uh, major providers of research and scholarship opportunities. The first one I have here is Athabasca from Canada, um, providing master's programs and having a cadre of very high quality uh, international quality researchers like Anderson and Garrison and, and many others. University of Maryland, University College offers master's programs of high quality. They have a very interesting model. Uh, they they uh, use uh, faculty of their own 
institution very little, but they draw on uh, the best faculty wherever they're located around the world, which I thoroughly approve of, and I wish my own institution would, uh, but they don't. Uh, so uh, Peters, Holmberg, and myself, among others, are still on their faculty, and I haven't taught for them for the last couple of years or so. Um, and there may be somebody here who is on their faculty. I just had an email a couple of days ago, and it's a whole raft of, you know, the world's, some of the world's best people teach online for the University of Maryland University College in their master's program. And it's in association with the University of Oldenburg in Germany. Uh, we have a, what we call world campus with more than 50 online degrees and certificate programs. Uh, uh, UNED, I, I've mentioned two leading um, international uh, uh, agencies I think are worthy of, of noting. Uh, one is the United Na UNESCO's Institute of Integrating Technology in Education, IITE, uh, which works out of, out of Moscow, and the Commonwealth of Learning I mentioned earlier. In recent years, uh, there has been a development of uh, doctoral research, and this is an interesting figure. Uh, last year, we looked up uh, the Dissertations International uh, Index, and we found that if we put in keywords correspondence study, we saw 20 between 1932 and 76, 20 between 81 and 2001, and 231 under distance education, uh, 81 to 94, and 947 between 95 and 2006. And I took a picture uh, of, uh, I think there were 14 nationalities uh, represented in our little group there the year that I took that, um, that, I took that, uh, that photograph. So the doctoral research is developing. The quality is getting better. Um, the future is looking very good. And I would close with one slightly pessimistic statement. I hope I can turn it to sound uh, positive, but the field is the field. And within the field, there are subfields. And some of the subfields are referred to as um, online learning, uh, e learning. Uh, blended learning, tele-learning, uh, flexi-learning, asynchronous, web-based, distrib did I say distributed, distributed, and so on. What can I say or what can we do to get us to understand what the big umbrella is or what the broad foundation is or what the big framework is within which each of these are important applications? Of course, tele-learning or flexi-learning or open learning are important, but the problem is if we can't get our students and our colleagues to understand the big picture, what happens is a student goes to do a search and puts in keywords like open learning or e-learning. Now, e-learning actually makes no sense because our business is not learning. Our business is learning and teaching. Education is a two-sided relationship. It's a two-sided relationship. There is learning, and there's the people who help the learning. So it's teaching and learning. And E is what? Electronic, I suppose. Does that include movies and television, which is electronic? Uh, so we, we've got some slippage, some little carelessness in our terminology. And terminology doesn't matter. It does matter when you're developing theory. And theory matters 
because it guides or it misguides researchers. So it's going back to that earlier point. If someone write, does a lot of data gathering and analyzes and reports, but it's based on what they found online under the heading e-learning or flexi-learning or distributed learning, but it neglects the other pieces, then it's very narrowly focused. And something that people learned about the characteristics of students, shall we say, in one of the other sub-areas is, is missed. So they write a report that says, you know, the way that students learn is, and I read that and I say, well, hold on a minute. There's some more about this over here, but they didn't get it over here because they were restricted in the terminology that they used. So this terminology issue is a real challenge for we who are uh, involved and in promoting research and scholarship in our field. My watch tells me to stop, so I will stop. <laughs> I was hoping we could have a chance for some discussion, but the program is uh, very strict, so perhaps during the next day or two we can do this informally. Thank you. The first part of my question, what do you make out of the spectacular failure of the British Open University on the American market? And at the second part, don't you think that Wedemeyer's ideas are better in instantiated by something like University of Phoenix than really British Open University? Thank Give me 30% of the money that British Open University uses for any project and I will manage it and get it done. Uh, uh, to Excellent points, and um, the research that people do a lot is about technology. The research that people do not do enough is about pedagogy. The research that people do de nada is about effective organization, very little. And the research that people are afraid of is policy and politics. And the British Open University, you know, at, say it the most simple, it's more complex of course, but, but the kernel, the, the, the kernel of the, of the problem is they knew about technology, they even knew about pedagogy, they knew quite a lot about organization. They're better than most, most. But they didn't know about the policy and the politics. That is, and, and there, there, there's one, aspect, one other aspect to that, and it's part of it. Organization means culture. It's not simply how you do it, but uh, the relationship within the organization and the relationship between the organization and parts of the organization and what lies outside. And uh, the, 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 the cultural problems for a foreign institution, and it applies to Gate and all others, you know, the cultural problems of moving into another environment, it looks easier than it is. And if you only move in on the basis of we got a technology, I can guarantee almost certain you'll fail. And if even if you have a relatively good pedagogy, you probably will fail. But it, it's the policy and the cultural issue that kills most innovations. And, and, and it was an excellent second point, which was, um, oh, Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix are applying the industrial model better than most other institutions, definitely including my own in the US. One quick anecdote, I sit in a meeting in my own institution and I say, why are we not using more what Americans call adjunct faculty? In the British system, the open university yeah. system, you say part-time tutors. It's much more uh, cost effective and better quality. You can get the best person from wherever that person is located to, to, uh, to, to, be, to provide your, your instruction. The answer I heard was, Michael, that would be the death of the professoriate. 
<laughs> and that's a culture. You know, you, you, you're, 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 you're right against a brick wall. Because what are we here for? We're not here primarily to support the professoriate. We should be here primarily for the kid at the, open, at the back door. But you can't, you, know, you, you just have to keep chipping away. They're wonderful questions. Actually, you can see I, uh, I relate to the question very well. <laughs> I'm Babatunde Ikpaye from the National Open University of Nigeria. Professor Moore, thank you very much for this uh, foundation. Quite brilliant, quite educative. My question is this. You had experiences in Africa, particularly East Africa. You're looking at the foundations. Um, I'm surprised I've not heard the name of the UNISA, the uh, University of South Africa. It's part of the foundations, particularly sure. in Africa. Well, um, number two. As distance education builds up, do you see any role for the non-governmental organizations? Uh, in history, do you find any place where they have contributed? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zabato. The first one is easy. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was a consultant for the African National Council, the ANC, in the six months or the year preceding the democratic election in South Africa in 1994-95. So I know UNISA very well. I went there, I sat in a room like this with all the Africana uh, Senate of University of South Africa. That and the question at that time was, do we close, get rid of UNISA? UNISA, I hope I may. UNISA, University of South Africa, in its public relations projected what is quite true that it had provided opportunity to black South Africans who were denied opportunity within the conventional system. That was true, including Nelson Mandela and, and others had had some educational opportunities through UNISA. But that was the public face. But the truth is that the curriculum was extremely sympathetic to the apartheid Africana perspective. Uh, what they called Christian fundamentalism was the philosophical foundation for what they taught in schools. And UNISA in its, in its, uh, in its programs taught that. So UNISA uh, played, a, uh, and let me say one, and you probably know this, maybe this was your question. UNISA began in about eight, the end of the 19th century uh, when from the University of South Africa came out of the University of Cape Town at the turn of the century and was one of the very first institutions anywhere in the world to have a correspondence program. So perhaps that's what you had in mind. So in the history of distance education, UNISA has an important place I would say that it became somewhat corrupted by the apartheid system. It did do a lot of good, but it also was part of that system. And so there was a significant political issue in the 1990s as to whether UNISA should be sustained or not. And the decision was to sustain it, uh, to get rid of the old guard and bring in new people, and to link it up with uh, Technicon and Technisa and other other important South African institutions. So it's an important, uh, it's an important um, uh, uh, institution in the history of our field. What was the second part of that question? Oh, the, the non-governmental agencies. Well, uh, the UN agencies like uh, UNHCR and um, the, I've, I've done work with, I forgot what they call them now, the family, UN, I mean, the, the, the international agencies um, internally within their own training programs have distance education programs. Um, the World Bank certainly has been a major contributor to the encouragement of distance education programs. Um, I need to think of, I, I'm sure of the churches. 
Um, the churches uh, have historically, going, going way back, had uh, their own uh, distance education programs. Um, I can't think of the Red Cross has. I need to th think a little bit more. It's not coming off the top of my head, okay. but it's a very good question. I think there's something there to look at. Okay. Yeah. My name is Igor Katerniak. I am from Ukraine. I have a question. If case we will be have a Nobel Prize, if this, if case we will have Nobel awards, Nobel Prize, I'm sorry. Nobel Prize okay. for what? For distance education, who who should be? Oh, Nobel, Nobel Prize. Prize. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I have a question to you. What do you think? Who should be awarded? Let's say uh, for 2007. By, by such price. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's a question. Distance education, real distance education, as compared to... See, the, here, here's a problem we have. We, we have a history, we have a philosophy, we have a methodology, of distance education. And, and the method includes the use of communication technologies to join people who have learning needs to people who have teaching resources. The problem that we have today is that conventional educators having a computer are quite comfortable redefining themselves as distance educators. But the pedagogy, the philosophy, the theory, the mission is very often missing. So I'm not sure why I got that in answer to the Nobel Prize. I, I think I'm saying we're not going to get a Nobel Prize anytime <laughs> in the near future. I don't think it's a problem. <laughs> okay.